Hi everyone, good evening. Welcome to our final event celebrating our Wikipedia Edit-a-thon. My name is Katherine Styers and I'm the Special Collections Research and Outreach Specialist at the College of Charleston. For those who don't know, the College of Charleston Special Collections and South Carolina LGBTQ Archives hosted a virtual Edit-a-thon this week with a focus on adding local LGBTQ historical content to Wikipedia. Before we show the real Rainbow Road Tour, we wanted to share some of our accomplishments for the week, including the following statistics. We had 14 participants complete 116 edits, adding 4,600 words and 61 references to 14 articles. Of the 14 articles that were created or edited, we wanted to talk about just a few highlights. Before this project, Wikipedia did not have an article on what is known as the candlestick murder, which will be talked about just a little later during the Real Rainbow Road Tour. An undergraduate volunteer really took ownership of that article and added almost a thousand words to what started out as a short stub with very little information. Since its creation, the article has already been viewed over 100 times, which goes to show how much of an impact public history work can have when you make it more accessible to participate. Participants also contributed to 13 other articles, including the organization We Are Family, the Alliance for Full Acceptance, the Garden and Gun Club, anthropologist Joseph Tolles, Laura Bragg, John Martin Taylor, and more. Now people searching for LGBTQ history in Charleston will be able to find so many sources and resources they may not have otherwise had access to, which was the main goal of this project. Next, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Rebecca Thayer. Hi, my name is Rebecca Thayer. Um, I'm the project archivist for the South Carolina LGBTQ Archive in Special Collections at the College of Charleston. Um, I'm going to introduce our tour guide for this evening, um, Harlan Green. Harlan Green is currently the scholar in residence at Special Collections at the College of Charleston, working on the South Carolina LGBTQ archive. He's the author of several books, including the Lambda Literary Award winning What the Dead Remember. His most recent book is The Damned Don't Cry, They Just Disappear, The Life and Works of Harry Hervey. He is currently working on a history of LGBTQ life in Charleston from our earliest records to the modern day. Um, so let's turn it over to Harlan to introduce. Uh, Everybody, um, it's uh, as advertised, I'm Harlan Green. I'm really glad to be here with you all. Um, and it's a great introduction and I'm looking forward to seeing the um, tour myself because I'm camera shy, I haven't seen it. Um, but also um, willing to talk a little bit maybe in the question and answer about um, you know, what, how we did put it together. This actually refers to an older thing that we had up quite a long time ago, the real Rainbow Row, which what y'all have done for Wikipedia is just really great because we had specifically tried to get a footprint up there about LGBTQ history, so I think we have. And now it's my turn to go ahead and try to introduce um, Brandon Reed. Brandon is also part of our team here on the, um, is our LGBTQ archives at the College of Charleston, and he'll tell you what he does. I just take credit for what everyone else does. Brandon? Hi, as Harlan said, uh, my name is Brandon Reed. And I, uh, I work as the oral history coordinator for the project. Um, we, the project so far has conducted over 70 interviews. We have uh, 25 interviews are, on, are currently available on the Low Country Digital Library um, on their website. You can check that out at, um, at, by Googling the Low Country Digital Library. Um, and if you want to learn more about the, the uh, or history archives, and if you're interested in contributing in oral history, you can always visit our website to learn more. So I guess I'll turn it back over to, to Harlan. I'm glad to take it, but um, so if, um, does anyone else want to speak? And before we actually do um, um, introduce the, the tour itself. 
Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, Carlin, uh, we can, I can go ahead and um, start sharing the tour with everybody. Hi, I'm Harlan Green. I'm with the LGBTQ Archive at the Avilstone Library at the College of Charleston. Obviously not in the library today, but out here on the streets of the city. You might look around these streets and, you're not, and you'll see plaques and monuments to all parts of the city's history, but you won't see anything relating to our community's history. And that's what we're doing, what we're doing in the archive, why we're compiling materials and why we're doing research to prove that Charleston has a very long and storied LGBTQ history right here. Specifically at this corner, I'm standing at the corner of Broad and Meeting, the four corners of law, where four different branches of government have their buildings represented here. Right behind me is the federal courthouse. And the federal courthouse represents the ruling in 2015 that gave LGBTQ people the right to marry. And this year in 2020, it also ruled that LGBTQ people are included under the 1964 Civil Rights Act and protecting us from employment. But if you look across the street at what is now the county courthouse, the history there is not quite so happy. This once was the British seat of royal government. And in the 1550s, Britain had made buggery, which is the term that they use for non-procreative sex, a crime. That's the 1550s. And in 1712, the colony of Carolina followed suit and it remained on the law books until 1868. So you could actually be put to death. It was a capital crime for being queer in South Carolina, the longest reign of any such law in the United States. Happily, it's not so bad today. And then if we cross the street and see City Hall. I'm not exactly sure what went wrong with my desktop. But as you can see, there are lots of people always going by on the streets of Charleston, lots of noise and stuff like that. But again, people walking by all the time, never seeing any marks at all about LGBTQ history in the city of Charleston. So while we're working on our, our technical difficulty, um, I can go ahead and ask one of the questions that we got. Harlan, if you'd be okay going ahead and answering the first question. Sure. So how did you select individuals that were featured on the Real Rainbow Row project? Well, I think the Real Rainbow Row has been up for at least four or five years. And um, and if you look at it, and again, it's just real, uh, it's on um, one of the College of Charleston's web pages. And obviously, if you Google it, it'll turn up there as well, too. But maybe all that worked on the Wikipedia articles are very aware of it. Um, it's a combination of very well known gay people like, you know, um, Oscar Wilde, perhaps, you know, the most well known gay person in the 19th century, and Gertrude Stein talking about where they came to town. And I think you can get kind of that LGBTQ history anywhere. It was nice to personalize it. But then the other, the other, sites chosen were basically just sort of the materials that were on the surface before actually we began our project. So, you know, things that were sort of known already, like the candlestick murder that someone did a very good Wikipedia entry on, and a variety of things, mostly people that were in living memory, you know, people that we knew about and um, had not necessarily been um, researched to the extent that the Wikipedia articles have done it. But so it was a combination of that. And um, as we're trying to do in our project in the archives itself, we tried to be as um, inter, you know, as inclusive as we could be, um, you know, trying to include African American people as well, women as well as men, trying to get um, to some extent over time as well. So it was kind of a grab bag, but again, it was the, the stuff that we can easily do. And I'm glad to say now with all the information that's come in, we could certainly add many more sites 
and possibly in the future it won't all be virtual. There might actually be a plaque one day on a building. Are there any sites in particular that you're interested in in adding? Um, there, you know, as, as we've discovered in um, special collections, there was a very um, famous or infamous person, probably an intersex individual in Charleston in the 1850s. Um, that would certainly be a uh, interesting story to add to as well. Um, so many people, unfortunately, are pegged at sites that we don't actually, the buildings are no longer standing. One conscious thought was when we started the real Rainbow Row, and I think we will change this as we write our history, is we didn't want to feature entirely on bars. So many times in LGBTQ history, you know, um, L gay history is always seems to be synonymous with LGBT, with um, bar history. And so then, you know, we will be doing that as well, but we really wanted to, again, talk about people's lives um, and maybe show how, how perhaps how cloistered and how individual they were before the bars evolved. Great, so it looks like we are ready to give the video another shot. Right, look both ways before you cross the street. It's a very dangerous intersection and I'm sure that's what happened. Any anti-gay laws as well. But it's also been the site more recently of good ones. In 1868, there was a law passed against cross-dressing. You could be arrested for appearing in clothes of a member of the opposite sex. But in 2018, Charleston passed an, uh, a hate crime bill. And so we are actually now a city with a hate crime bill in a state that does not have one. And finally, across the street is St. Michael's Church, the oldest church building left in town. And it's also the site for gay, a battlefield for gay rights. South Carolina likes to secede. We left the Union in 1860, and in the 20th century, congregations like St. Michael's seceded from the Episcopal Diocese of South Carolina in a way, not over slavery, but over the issue of ordaining women in gay marriage. This congregation may not sanction it, but you know what? Just right down Broad Street is the probate court, and that's where in 2015, the first lesbians in the city of Charleston took out their marriage license and got married. So although there are no signs or plaques, you can see that LGBTQ history was, is being, and will continue to be made right here. Just a block away from the Four Corners of Law is 38 Chalmers Street. This little brick house was built in the 1840s for a free woman of color named Jane Whiteman. But we're here because of another remarkable woman, a lesbian who helped change the city of Charleston. That was Laura Mary Bragg. Miss Bragg was not born here, but born in Massachusetts in 1881. She came to Charleston in 1909 to work at the Charleston Museum, which then was housed on the College of Charleston campus. She helped move the institution to a new site, and she became director of the Charleston Museum in 1920, the first woman to head such a scientific natural history museum in our country. She was discreet in her love affairs with women, probably because she had to be. She raised enough eyebrows just being a woman with what she wanted to do. She could never achieve what she did if she were open about her sexuality. And what did she achieve? Miss Bragg, as she demanded to be called, opened the Charleston Museum to Blacks for the first time in its history. And she also founded the Charleston County Public Library. She not only discovered and exhibited many facts about Charleston's past, but she also shaped the future of the city with people like DeBose Hayward, who wrote the novel Porgy, the basis of the opera Porgy and Bess, and others like Josephine Pinckney, the very gay-friendly novelist who lived right next door to Miss Bragg. She founded the Poetry Society of South Carolina, which helped trigger the era we call the Charleston Renaissance. And it was because of that movement that Charleston has become the artist and tourist mecca that it is today. She was a suffragette and a prime mover in the preservation effort as well. It was in her house that she bought in 1927 that she entertained many cultural leaders who came to town, the, Carson, the writer Carson McCullers, whom we'll mention later on this tour. She also mentored many young people, like the young gay artist Ned Jennings, whose studio was across the street. 
she offered him work at the Charleston Museum, and when Ned killed himself in 1929, it was Miss Bragg who saved his artwork, many which have homoerotic themes. They would have no doubt have been destroyed by his family. She was a great believer in progress. Museums were not just for preserving history, she believed, but places where people could learn about progress and learn about civilization and go on and help add to that progress and be a link in history. She is one of our unsung heroines and we remember her and claim her, there is, though there's no memorial here. And as we said, it was in the building across the street, the Confederate home, that the young man she tried to help, Ned Jennings, killed himself over a failed love affair with another young man in 1929. Unfortunately, there are many similar sad stories in our LGBTQ history, and one of the saddest ones is just a few blocks from here. Now I'm standing in front of the house at 14 Queen Street, the site of one of the most tragic episodes in our recent LGBTQ history. In the 1950s, it was the home of two gay men who were roommates. Their names were Jack Dobbins and Edward Odie. Everyone in the neighborhood knew they were gay, and no one seemed to be bothered by it. According to one oral history we have in our LGBTQ archive, people knew it, and this was a live and let live community with actors and many poor people, black and white, living nearby. On Halloween 1958, Jack Dobbins attended an all-male party, and then he went out to the bars on King Street. While there were no gay bars per se, there were those that were mixed and had a gay clientele as long as we behaved. Mr. Dobbins went to at least two bars that night, the Elbow Room Cocktail Lodge and Club 49, which advertised itself as the gayest spot in town. Somewhere that night, Jack Dobbins met a young man named Jack Mann, a 19-year-old airman dressed in dungarees and a leather jacket which one gay man noted was the costume favored by male prostitutes. They went to several bars together and Dobbins paid for all the drinks. Dobbins then asked Mann to come back to this house. He did. And while we know something of what happened next, we will probably never know the whole story. The next day, Dobbins was found dead, murdered, bludgeoned to death by a candlestick. And Mann was back on the air base bragging and showing his friends money and possessions that had belonged to the murdered man. Mann was arrested for the murder of Jack Dobbins and the trial, which began in December, was a travesty. For if people in this neighborhood had a live and let live mentality, the city, state, and country did not. It seemed to many in the courtroom that the victim was being put on trial and not the defendant. Mann's defense attorney focused mostly on the victim bringing up such damning evidence that Jack Dobbins, the dead man, had not had any girlfriends, but had lots of men over visiting him here, including Citadel cadets. Worse still, he had nude statues in his bedroom and had the audacity to sleep on lavender sheets. All this was touted in the news. Dobbins' roommate was forced to confess that he feared Jack had homosexual tendencies, and that was really was on trial in that courtroom. On one side, there was this normal, supposedly upstanding young man who accepted drinks from a man and went home with him, and, a young, and that young man whose mother had come to town to cry over him in the courtroom. He was a member of the military. And on the other side, the dead man was a homosexual and aberrant social menace who made improper advances to that young man. This was an era when queers were considered security risks and possible parts of a communist pact to weaken our country. But the irony is, is that Dobbins had served in the military too, but no one brought that up in the trial. The jury's verdict was swift. Dobbins' murderer was found innocent and set free. This terrified many gay people in the city. Seeing that you could be murdered for being gay in the city would not protect you. I spoke to a gay man, now dead, who was growing up in Charleston then, and he told me he got the message loud and clear. As soon as he could, he left Charleston and did not survive and did not come back here for years. But others were stronger and managed to survive those anti-gay terrors of the 1950s. To follow that story, I'll need to take you to another place in another part of town. I'll see you there shortly. I'm now at 9 College Street on the corner of College and Green, when this used to be streets long before it became part of the College of Charleston campus. This house was built in the 19th century 
and later on it was home to the book basement, an incredible bookstore. It was also home to two amazing gay men in the city of Charleston, John Ziegler and Edwin Peacock. They coincidentally were also friends of Laura Bragg, whose house we stopped by earlier, and they were also impacted by the candlestick murder as well. But there is a lot more to their story. John was born in Manning, South Carolina in 1912 and came here at his aunt's house as a boy. He graduated from the Citadel in 1932 and he founded their literary magazine, The Shaco, and even had love affairs there. In 1940, he met Edwin Peacock from Thomasville, Georgia, born in 1910. They fell in love and their relationship lasted 49 years. With World War II starting, John and Edwin enlisted together in the Navy and they kept in touch. After the war, they came back and opened the bookstore here on the ground floor. That was February 19, 1946, the birthday of Southern novelist Carson McCullers, who had based a gay character in her first novel, A Heart is a Lonely Hunter, on Edwin. He had encouraged her when she was just a young girl, and Edwin had introduced her to her husband. Carson McCullers and other famous people would come here over the years, as the bookstore became sort of a stop on the gay underground railroad. Famous writers such as Langston Hughes, children's author Maurice Sendek, who summered on Folly Beach, stopped by, as did artist Prentice Taylor. John and Edwin were a committed couple, fairly out in the homophobic 1950s and beyond. They were questioned by the police after the candlestick murder about the identities of people who might be gay and the military kept asking them about soldiers and sailors who might be that way. While they were mum on that topic, they were outspoken on civil rights, serving on the city's interracial committee and opening their bookstore to black readers, teachers, and librarians long before others did. This was a cultural crossroads in the city. When the college commandeered this property, John and Edwin moved and continued to improve the city and to support music scholarships at the College of Charleston. John would give nearly a million dollars over the years before he died at age 103. He gained fame when a book called Jeb and Dash was published in 1994, a look at gay life in Washington, D.C. in the 1930s. If you look for John in those pages, you'll see that his name has been changed to Nicky Bowen. John went on to write a book of poems dedicated to Owen, Edwin, and his autobiography. All are available in our LGBTQ archives and special collections. John and Edwin's contributions were many, but they also showed you can live an out and committed life despite the horrors of homosexuality which society demanded you believe. But sadly, when the college wanted to memorialize them, we were not as brave as John and Edwin were themselves. This memorial to them in front of Nine College only calls them business partners, censoring the fact that they were committed to each other and in love for nearly 50 years. You can read more of their story and see images of at our new college webpage at discovering.cfc.edu. Now I'll hope you follow me to the site of another love story that crossed race and class lines. It's an important part of our college and our national history. Thank you. Avery Research Center, a few blocks from the main campus of the College of Charleston, was originally built right after the Civil War to educate freed men and women. Over the years, this building played a very important role in Charleston civil rights history. We know that many LGBTQ people were associated with Avery, both as students and as teachers, but documenting them has been very difficult to do, but we are determined to do that as part of our larger project and the archives at Avery. It's here that this building is now a cultural center and it's home to the internationally important papers of anthropologist Colin Turnbull and his beloved Joseph Tolles. I'm quoting from the finding aid on Avery's website that describes them and their importance. African-American anthropologist Joseph Tolles was born in Virginia in 1937 and moved to New York City to pursue an acting and writing career. In 1959, he met English anthropologist Colin McMillan Turnbull, with whom he exchanged marriage vows in 1960, something pretty astonishing. Colin Turnbull was older, white, born in 1924 in England, educated at Oxford, 
He joined the Royal Navy, lived in India, and then traveled to Africa in 1951. There he encountered the Mabuti people, the subject of his very famous 1962 book, The Forest People. That book won him praise for his portrayal of the Mabuti people as exemplars of human capacity for goodness and love. In 1959, he became curator of African ethnology at the American Museum of Natural History. And that's where he met Joseph Tolles. He resigned in 1969, claiming that the museum discrimination against him and his partner and other African Americans prompted him to do it. Tolles had started there as a volunteer and went on to get his PhD in anthropology as well. In 1988, Joseph Tolles died from AIDS. Turnbull staged a double funeral with two caskets, one representing his own spirit. He spent much of the energy of the rest of his life dedicated to memorializing and drawing attention to Joseph Toll's legacy. He arranged for Toll's paper and possessions to be transferred here to the Avery Research Center. After being ordained as a Buddhist monk by the Dalai Lama, Turnbull himself died of AIDS in 1994 and was buried next to Toll's. It's a triumphant and a tragic story simultaneously, but perhaps the most important thing about it is that their story survives here in the archives. Saving stories like theirs is one of the things we do in our LGBTQ archives and what we try to do on the streets of here in Charleston today to show you that Charleston has always had an incredible LGBTQ history. That's our mission, but we can't do it by ourselves. We need you to contribute LGBTQ materials. We need your oral histories and we need funds from you as well to keep our project going. If we can do our work with your help, we can prove, as I said, that we do have a great history. And you know what? There'll be monuments to Charleston's LGBTQ history on the streets yet. You just wait and see. Great, so now we're going to go ahead and um, get started with our question and answer session. So if anyone else has any questions, you can just drop that in the Q&A um, and we'll answer those. So our first question is, what is the largest hurdle for getting proper LGBTQ history representation at the city level in Charleston? And excuse me, what's the largest hurdle? Was that it? Yes. Could you repeat the question again? So I was, I was focusing on the word that I couldn't hear. Yeah, of course. So what is the largest hurdle for getting proper LGBTQ history representation at the city level in Charleston? Um, that's a tough one. I mean, um, and I would think there probably are no hurdles. Maybe the biggest hurdle is apathy um, because so many of the memorials, if we're specifically talking about history and not LGBTQ legislation, um, you know, getting history known, um, people can, there is a process in the city of Charleston that people can say, I want a monument here, or I want a memorial there. And so then, you know, um, I want to sign on my house that says this. So there are processes to go forward. I think, um, so, so, and maybe like I said, the largest um, hurdle would be apathy. And maybe the other one would be ignorance that there actually is LGBTQ history here and what folks have done with the Wikipedia articles and maybe what this tour has done will do. But I do think we are making an impact. As I said, our um, our small um, tour on, you know, on the website, it's called The Real Rainbow Row. I do have to say that there are now two companies in town that offer LGBTQ tours um, specifically based on our history under the name The Real Rainbow Row. So I do think maybe the largest hurdle has already been crossed, um, that knowledge like this is slowly percolating to it. The city knows that there's an enormous number of LGBTQ um, tourists who come here. And um, hopefully again, with this work done with the Wikipedia project, the major hurdle inertia will have been overcome and um, we won't have to be doing this a year from now that um, there, will be, um, there will be signs on buildings. So it won't be a closeted history, it will be an out history. 
So our next question says, you talk in the video about there not being monuments to the LGBTQ people who lived at or are associated with these particular places. Right now we're having a public conversation about the appropriateness of monuments and who we celebrate in public spaces. Do you see an importance for memorials to LGBTQ people in Charleston and why? I certainly see the importance because, um, you know, we've been here even before, um, you know, before European civilization comes, came, you know, there's the Gullah phrase, um, come here's and been here's. And, you know, the earliest explorers coming through in the 1580s noted LGBTQ people in, in the area. So we have been here from before the beginning. Um, and, you know, and we are, we are about the only ethnic group or some kind of socioeconomic group or any kind of group that has not had representation on the streets of Charleston. There are memorials to Jews. There are memorials to blacks. There are memorials to certainly the elite white people. And we are just part of the family and you don't get the entire history um, unless um, we're included. There are two memorials two places in the city of Charleston where an LGBTQ history is mentioned. One is on the Holocaust Memorial on Calhoun Street next to the statue of Calhoun, which has just been taken down. It lists gay people as victims of the Holocaust. And then um, on Society Street, there is a marker marking the, um, the home of um, transsexual Don Langley Hall Simmons. But the language on that um, on that marker is considered inappropriate. And I do have to thank people who are working on our project for actually trying to make sure that the words actually ex um, parallel the reality. That's Rebecca who did it, yes. No, I just wanted to add to that um, to say that uh, we've been working with um, Chase Glenn of the Alliance for Full Acceptance about that he was in contact with the Preservation Society about um, that specific marker. I think um, especially when it comes to the LGBTQ community that um, one of the issues with markers can be um, how quickly terminology changes. Um, you know, even 10 years ago, it wasn't as common to see the acronym LGBTQ. You know, you'd see GLBT some uh, a lot of times or just um, LGBT without the Q, you know. So, um, and even today, there's no consensus on LGBTQ as the one acronym. Um, so I think uh, when we are making these memorials and monuments, it might take more consideration. That doesn't mean it shouldn't be done, um, but I think it's something to keep in mind. And I, I can say too, um, like we did say on the discovering.cfc.edu, obviously it's so much easier to put up a virtual memorial um, than, than brick and stone. So the college itself is now reinterpreting its own history. So if one does visit that site and sees nine College Street on that, um, you know, the the history, the LGBTQ gay history of that site is mentioned as well. And I'm assuming that's how things are going to be going in the future, you know, with more virtual uh, memorials, perhaps more than brick and stone. Great. So our next question says, what would be necessary to get the plaque at Nine College updated to tell the full story? You know, that brings up the whole thing of like the Calhoun Monument as well, too. Do you take it down or do you not? So um, I will say that the president of the college has just um, created a new committee on the namings of buildings and how they're known. Um, and yours truly is on that committee. So consider that um, suggestion as part of an agenda for a meeting. Um, a part of me uh, you know, a part of me wants to keep that there as a teaching tool to see how history was silenced. It would be great to have another plaque on that. And I do think, um, you know, I do think that's one way that we can sort of have our cake and eat it too. We can put the true story up, but then we can see how people tried to edit the story out and edit that story as well.
All right, so our next question is um, a little bit longer and Rebecca and Brandon and Harlan, anyone can feel free to chime in. Catherine, so, I wanted to comment on uh, yeah. what Harlan said because I think um, it's really interesting. You know, um, I remember seeing video, like, video of an interview with um, uh, a gay man talking about how when his partner died, um, the Post and Courier refusing to list him as one of the survivors um, of his of his partner. And, you know, that was shocking to me at the time. And I think um, there is something to be said for how um, we might not realize how we were treated in the past and, and how things were erased. So I think that's uh, interesting. You can go ahead for the next question. <laughs> I'll just say real briefly too, in our, vis in our um, if you take the virtual tour non-college way, we specifically point that out um, to basically say again, as, as, as was said in the video, that again, this plaque being put up there was an attempt to erase history and not to fully embrace it. So to some extent, again, you know, again, it's you've got the bronze plaque up there. You've also got the app that you can download. And I'm assuming these days more young people are probably going to download the app than read the bronze plaque. So we may, we're getting our point across even even when um, what's inscribed in metal does not tell the story. So the next question says, working on the South Carolina LGBTQ archives, a lot of people might not know what archives entail or what types of materials an archive might want. Can you give an example of something that was donated to the archives that you found unique and important? I might ask Rebecca if she wants to do that first. Rebecca's got the enviable job is, you know, um, you know, is actually touching the materials, making them available for researchers, um, you know, and, and actually, you know, you know, sort of getting down into the granular thing of it. You know, I may bring a box in, but Rebecca's the one that can actually touch everything in the box and then find the words to describe it for people. Yeah, so um, something that was really interesting that I found um, because it was it was something that connected two collections in a really unique way. Um, the first collection I processed was um, John Martin Taylor, who uh, is a gay man who had a culinary bookstore in Charleston in the 90s. And um, he had in his papers a piece of homophobic hate mail that he received on a blank white postcard um, with very distinctive handwriting and highlights about, you know, how he's, you know, a demon and this kind of thing. Um, I can't remember the exact language. But then when I was processing the Alliance for Full Acceptance papers, they also had a piece of hate mail on a blank white postcard with that same handwriting and the same highlights and the same type of language. Um, and it was just interesting to see how this person had, you know, had been actively sending this hate mail out to multiple people in the city of Charleston um, who are gay or associated with gay organizations. Um, and, you know, just uh, two little pieces of paper, but it really showed, I guess, the type of things that people would have been receiving that we might not think of and um, some of the attitudes of people, even, even today, some people still have those kinds of attitudes. And if I can add a little bit too, it's interesting what's turned up in other collections, which we weren't necessarily looking for. Um, you know, we got the papers of an organization called the Grassroots League back in the 1950s, where they were fighting integration and that kind of thing. And sure enough, there was, incredible hate literature there and as well too you know if you were trying to um you know stop society from progressing if you were trying to stop integration then you were you were also trying to stop homosexuals from getting that as well so it's been interesting to sort of like querying the archives is also you know seeing what already already existed in our archives that maybe we had not picked up on and described um 
but there were other things already already in there. But you know, now again, it's it's an act of trying to put people, you know, to, to actually again, people have place at the table and on the shelves and the archives. All right, so someone is asking if there's a way to get a copy of the video and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I believe we're putting that up on YouTube. So once that's done, um, we can push the link and get it out there so folks can rewatch it. Um, our next question is, what are the names of the two companies that provide LGBTQ tours? Um, I think one of them is called Bulldog Tours um, and I think the other one is called Walk and Talk Charleston. I believe, but um, you know, just talk to your best friend Google and put in, um, you know, um, the real rainbow row. The college's web page will come up first, and then I think if you go down there, and um, as we have the phrase, I'm just saying that if you look at the descriptions of the other tours of the real rainbow row. I do think that you will notice an incredible similarity um, between the sites that we describe, the sites that they say that are on the tour, but that is all for the good, you know, so we are just taking, you know, it's not just a historical impact that we are having on this city and the city acknowledging its future visibility as well. It's interesting that LGBTQ history is having an economic impact on the city of Charleston as well that people are now can actually take those tours um, and get the gay history and money goes into the pockets and into the coffers of the city, which to me again argues to the fact that the city, there are so many reasons for the city to acknowledge its LGBTQ history. So our next question is interesting. If you were able to erect a statue of a Charleston LGBTQ icon, who would it be? I'm going to ask everybody to unmute so we can all say um, who we want. Um, and if someone can jump, because I'm going to have, that's a thinker. I'm scratching my chin on that one. Um, you know, if it's got to be an individual person, uh, I'm trying to think who might have had the major impact, um, which I can't think of right now. If someone, if either Brandon or Rebecca or you, or you, Catherine, yourself, can think about the one person that jumps out in your mind. Maybe we can choose our personal favorites and not necessarily maybe the ones that are the most important. Anyone else have a thought? Well, Brandon does. Yeah, I do. Um, just just because it's someone that I, I, I'm fascinated with. Um, there was a, a drag performer, a performer named Africa who um, Formed in the 1980s, um, whose name was uh, Brian Seabrook, um, and I just I've, I've always been fascinated by by Africa's story and the impact that sh that that as a performer that Africa had um, in the community. So and that you know still talked about today, people still well remembered, um, even though Africa passed in the early 90s. So I I would go with go with her. I'm going to put ditto marks right behind um, Brandon, and just to note that. Um, Cross fingers. Um, an anthropologist um, followed Africa around in the 1970s and filmed her. And just today, we made contact with that anthropologist, and we're trying to uh, get his films. And I will say, images of Africa have been displayed in museums around the world. With this anthropologist basically saying that she and her performance art, we used to call it drag, now it's considered performance art, the intersectionality of Gullah culture, of women's history, of black history, of gender fluidity, all seem to intersect in, um, in, in the person fondly known as Africa, named Brian Seabrook. And you know, hopefully at some point we will be able to put the images up. There had been a, a Miss Gay Charleston in Charleston since the 1950s. Africa was the first black person to become Miss Gay Charleston. So very good choice on your part, Brandon. I'm just putting ditto marks under yours. Well, uh, I guess I have to answer the question. Um, it is a really difficult one. Um, 
you know, because we've been having this conversation about um, statues, especially and statues as, you know, literally being larger than life, people we look up to. And um, so that would be really hard for me to pick, you know, some it would be a lot. I have to do a lot of research into someone that I I, I think you know, we could we could put a, a whole statue up for. Um, but if we're talking about, you know, people who have made a big impact, you know, I do think of Linda Kettner, who um, was a co-founder of the Alliance for Full Acceptance and a co-founder of SC Equality, which is a state lobbying group. And um, so the impact that those organizations have had has been really big and you know, that wouldn't have happened without her. So that's someone who I think of who has had a big impact on um, LGBTQ community, not only in the city, but in the state. And she has been a very good friend to our project as well. Um, she gave us a, a challenge grant to keep our project going, which happily we had to do it. So I might move one of my ditto marks, um, Brandon, from um, Africa, and I'll put another ditto mark under um, Rebecca. Great, so the next question says, so many stories about LGBTQ people are sad and tragic, but joy also exists. Could you share a funny anecdote about someone whose history you've archived? Brandon's got one. No, I'm, I was just going to point out that I, I like that question, and um, it's not really a funny anecdote, but that's why I've always um, I've always loved the story of, of John and Edwin in the book The Basement, because I think so much if you were growing up at a certain time, um, you'll remember any representation of, of LGBTQ people, every movie, it always ended sadly, it always ended in one or the other dying, it was always just very depressing. Um, and to hear a story of a couple living openly and happily um, at that time period and in the South in particular, um, that their story has always had an impact, I think, because of that, because it has a happy ending. I would also recommend people looking at our oral histories, only 20 some or so that are online. Some of them have great stories, you know, just incredibly funny things that we as um, interviewers, we cracked up listening to it. Uh, you know, some oral histories basically just talking about, um, you know, things that happened, um, you know, little oopses that were just incredibly funny. Um, one brief thing that I can talk about is um, in Ebony Magazine in 1951, there was this big shocking story about um, a woman in Sanford, Florida, an African-American woman being um, having to go to the um, doctor and it was all of a sudden shockingly revealed that this African-American woman that all the whites in town and all the blacks in town adored and looked up to her, she was actually male. And the story comes back to Charleston, South Carolina in the 1950s where this young black um, man left the farm, came to Charleston, found his role, her role, as you know, could not afford to be um, transgender, but lived as a woman, adopted children, had several husbands. And when she died, the national press wanted to ridicule her and make how fun of it. And her son actually went on record as saying, and using pronouns in the 1950s, using the pronoun she, she was the best woman that I had ever known. And to me, that is an incredibly heroic story that this young black person from South Carolina um, managed to get the love and affection, even in a very racially charged time, of a whole town standing up for her identification as a woman. So, you know, there are many, many happy stories like that. And I can talk a little bit about, um, not so much about specific stories that I have in my head right now, but um, as Harlan said, I get to process. Uh, so I get to look at a lot of pictures and stuff like that. And I really love um, when I get to process pictures of, you know, groups of friends. Um, I'm thinking of uh, John Martin Taylor, 
lived in Athens, Georgia in the 70s, and he was friends with members of the B-52s. And he has a lot of pictures of them all hanging out and, you know, stories of them, um, little drawings that they did on napkins and that sort of thing. Um, and then pictures from the Charleston Beach Bed and Breakfast, which was um, a gay bed and breakfast on Folly Beach. And, you know, pictures of parties there and, you know, just groups of, of gay friends having fun together. Um, and it's it's really special, even if you don't know who the people in the photograph are, um, but you can tell they're having a good time together. And I think of the papers of Lynn Dugan. You know, Lynn Dugan moved down here from, which we have moved down here from New York City. She knew some of the people at the, um, at the Stonewall riot. She was too young, but she later got to know some of the people involved in it. And she came down here and she was the moving force behind our first Pride um, march here. And so then hers is a very happy story. Um, and again, which we which will be part of our history. Um, and so then she's the one who came here and started the pride movement. She started, you know, um, the the um, the women's social club in Charleston. Hers, I think, is a very happy um, collection. You know, again, showing showing people coming out and her oral history, talking about how they never thought it was going to happen. They never thought it was going to happen. But the after the pride rally was held at the Citadel. You know, and so then there's this wonderful moving story in her oral history when the party's over and they look up and they see the rainbow flag fluttering over the walls of the Citadel, which to many is the bastion of male hierarchy in the city of Charleston. That's an incredibly touching and beautiful story. All right, our next question says, I'm assuming these projects are funded by soft money. And if so, what is going to happen with this project after funding runs out? Talk about sad stories. <laughs> so um, who knows? We, we, we have, you know, to quote Blanche Dubois, you know, relying on the kindness of strangers. We have always done that. And just for the um, nerds, Tennessee Williams did write some of the streetcar name desire in the city of Charleston at the Fort Sumter Hotel. So we do have a kinship with Blanche Dubois and relying on the kindness of strangers. We will keep fighting. We are encouraging the college to pick us up. We are fighting for uh, an LGBTQ alumni group. An event like this um, will help us to do it. Um, you know, we will go on, um, but it is a very much of a challenge. And I would and I would challenge everyone listening. Y'all have given of your time. Y'all that worked on the Wikipedia. Y'all have given of your time and energy. And that is without that has no price. That is priceless to it. But if you know of people that can help us with this, either within or without the college walls, please contact us. Please do what you can because. We see recently what the voice of the people out, you know, demonstrating and demanding attention can do. So, you know, we will survive in one form or another. We may not be as robust as we want to be, but, you know, once you're out of the closet, you can't go back in. Great. So since we are ending um, almost to the end here, almost running out of time. So, yeah, go ahead, Rebecca. Um, so I, I just did want to say, you know, that the archives, everything we have so far, the oral histories, none of that is going to get chucked out the door, you know, when we run out of soft money. Um, the college, it, what, you know, whether, you know, Harlan, Brandon and I are all here or not, the, you know, the college has a responsibility to protect um, the archives and the oral histories, you know, as long as the college is around, um, along with their other archives. So. Um, that's a responsibility and commitment that the college has already made to what we have so far. Great, so just one last uh, question. How can people support the project and what is upcoming in the future? I think again, that's something that we can all share and maybe talk about our, our part of it. Um, you know, I, you know, the supporting the college, you know, I spend up spending a lot, uh, supporting the project. 
I end up spending too much of my time talking about raising money, but I also think giving us your materials, giving us your ideas, giving us your suggestions, um, it, there's a cyclical thing. People think their history is not important, so they throw away their MCC brochures. I cannot tell you how many times we get to someone's house after someone dies or an organization, oh, we threw that away because we did not think it important. There is nothing of too little importance for at least us not to look at, you know, matchbooks from bars, um, photographs of gay marriages, um, you know, letters from uncles where they talk about their roommate, um, anything like that, you know, the, as, as Rebecca said, the materials tell the stories. There's certainly funding that's necessary to get the stories available, but as long as the stories survive, so that's one thing that we can do, and I'll turn it to my coworkers to talk about the other things that can be done. So yeah, I was just going to say, um, as far as or histories are concerned, upcoming, um, we have some exciting, some exciting things coming up. We had um, when the uh, Alliance for Full Acceptance donated their records, we had they had a radio show that was done, um, and we were able to digitize those tapes um, and get them transcribed. So those will be made available soon. Um, it's called the uh, Equal Time. It's really uh, a great, a great show, and it's a, a great time capsule of a period in South Carolina history um, in 2006 when uh, an amendment was passed to the state constitution banning same-sex marriage. Um, and this is prior to that, and trying to fight against it. Um, and it is a really, really great. So we have those coming up out online soon. Um, as I said earlier, we have 70 over 70 interviews done. Um, we have 25 online and there's another um, 17 um, that are ready to go online um, in the next couple months. So uh, keep checking back with us because we'll have more more or histories coming coming online soon. All right, so it looks like we are just about to reach the end of our time. We got through most of our questions, so we can go ahead and um, wrap things up. Harlan, was there any last comments or anything else that you wanted to say before we end? I do have to say thank you to y'all, and this is to everyone who um, who who gave to this and, and who really sort of plugging the holes in history. Um, um, I didn't want to start, and, and we won't end on a sad note, but I do have to say that at the College of Charleston today, we did have a little bit of a tragedy. Um, our new provost, Suzanne um, Austin, her husband, Don, Tom DiLorenzo, was, was murdered in cold blood on the streets of Charleston. So we as a College of Charleston, um, you know, we go, our feelings go out to her. Um, so we do have to say that she is part of our family, and I will say that you know one of the reasons that she was hired for the college is her commitment to LGBTQ causes. So I would ask everyone to maybe you know to um, keep keep her and the college in her thoughts. But as for closing things, again, I think you know is the first question that I misunderstood was hurdle. I thought it was turtle, and I was thinking, you know, that we're moving really slow, but I think we have crossed the first hurdle, and I think all of y'all had helped push us over that, you know, your commitment for watching this, your commitment for helping with the Wikipedia article, everyone, articles, everyone will know that I'm not a Pollyanna, but I do have to say I am very heartened by all this recent activity, and all I can say is, you know, you know, you know, Godspeed to all of us. We are going to continue on. And and as I said at the end of the video, with your help, there really is no telling what we can accomplish. Great. So um, if you're interested in contacting or otherwise supporting the South Carolina LGBTQ Archival Project, um, we'll put their information, contact information on your screen in just one moment. Um, again, we really appreciate the hard work of everyone involved with this project. And we definitely hope to do something like this again in the future.